by any problems. I started having problems with the Zoom, so hopefully Zoom will hold out because I like the Zoom recording better than the Facebook recording. Okay. All right, let's, uh, Galatians chapter three. And we're going to be dealing with verses one through 14, but we're going to uh, cut them up into little chunks and take them that way. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll deal with it that way. So, um, Victor, if you read verses one through six. Sure. Uh, verse one, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you've heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain? So again, I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by you believing what you've heard? So also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Amen. Any initial questions? I guess he was very upset, huh? Paul. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, he's been upset for a while now. But uh, actually, at this point, he actually begins to deal with the actual problem. Up to, here, up to this point, he's been talking about his past, who he was, you know, my lifestyle before I became a believer. Um, yeah. Then he deals with the whole, you know, Galatia had been infiltrated, the whole incident in Antioch, very historical, but now he's going to go into actual debating. And I guess he has to go to anger management. What's that? He has to take a course in anger management. Well, that that really, uh, yeah, if we if he was in modern times, they would say, why, why are you blowing off so much steam? Why are you so angry? And for him, it would be easy. He would say the gospel is being compromised. Um, and there's a real possibility that these individuals are going to fall from grace, which is a phrase he's going to use uh, later right. on in his letter, that they're going, to, they're going to leave the faith because they're getting into the law, which is ironic because, again, I don't, you know, thinking about modern times, I'm very shocked, again, that people don't see this, that uh, if, you, if you are born again by the Spirit of God, and then you try to finish the Christian life by putting on the law. You're literally abandoning the gospel. You're saying, yeah. you're saying the gospel is the law. And it's ironic how many Christians, and forget the law in the sense of like Mosaic law, which we have Messianic Jews doing that. But how many Christians, for example, start by grace and then they become legalistic? Uh, all about rules and regulations. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't this. And, and everything's about rules and regulation, and they try to impose those regulations on other people. And it's no longer salvation by grace. It's no longer I was saved by the grace of God, uh, but it's I'm being saved because I'm able to keep all these rules. So it's almost like you start by you start by grace, but then you try to earn your salvation, which is which is really weird. But I guess it's it's a very human. Uh, I think the human way of doing things is that we always want to earn our own redemption. We want to earn our own salvation. I think that's the human thing. Mm -hmm. um, I've never gotten into that. By the grace of God, I haven't. Not because I think I'm smarter than the people. I just think because I spent so much time with Paul that it just became like not possible for me. I realized, you know, <clears throat> I'm never going to be able to achieve salvation by my own powers. I'm never going to be able to do anything to, to acquire what can only come by grace. So why why try to do though why why whip myself or do any of these things knowing that none of these things will acquire salvation mm -hmm. but i guess it's just a human response to things and, and galatians you know just proves that humans are humans that two thousand years have passed and people are still people you know and that's why the gospel is always going to be applicable the bible is always going to be applicable because humans are still humans right and they and their own way of doing things is let me let me uh, acquire it for myself. So Paul, yeah, but here Paul really turns on turns on the heat. He begins to really get into the into the into the meat of the argument, and he really wants to uh, confront them on uh, on what they're doing. Any any questions? Anything else? No. All right. So let's jump in. Verse one: You foolish Galatians, 
you know? Uh, foolish, uh, the Greek word denotes either an insufficient or mistaken use of mental powers or deficiency in understanding itself. Uh, so again, uh, they lack understanding, uh, they're mistaken. Um, the Galatians have failed to perceive the false teaching as well as what it means to their central belief that salvation is through Jesus Christ alone. Um, again, uh, it's right in front of them. Uh, how can you have the gospel? How can you know the gospel? How can you be? Now, I don't know how many years they were believers before. I don't think they were believers for like an extensive period of time. So, I mean, so they, they are young Christians. They're, they're baby Christians. And so maybe it's easier for them to be deceived and to be lured away into, again, something that, that sounds pretty much like the gospel because these mm -hmm. false teachers are presenting, they're presenting Jesus, but Jesus with the law. And so you can see how someone who doesn't really know the scriptures, I mean, they don't have the New Testament. They don't have the teachings of Jesus. They're all oh, free. Right? And the letters of Paul is a new thing. Actually, this is the first letter by Paul. So it's not like they, they don't even have other letters by Paul. All they have is the Hebrew scriptures. And here are people saying, hey, the Hebrew scriptures teach circumcision. They teach all these things. So you should do them. So, but again, Paul takes it seriously because, because he did present the gospel to them. And this is why uh, this, this, verse, this verse is so powerful in that he brings Jesus Christ before their very eyes again and Jesus Christ crucified. Um, he says, who has bewitched you? Now here, um, it means something like, who has put the evil eye on you? Mm -hmm. uh, who was it? Uh, in that culture, just like in many parts of the world today, the idea of an evil eye, a common form of curse, was well known. Uh, Jesus the Messiah was betrayed before your very eyes, he says, is crucified. Ought that not to be enough to keep you from being blinded by something else? Uh, the deception does not come from the Galatian believers themselves. It comes from those who are preaching to them. But he's saying they should not have been able to deceive your eyes and put a spell on you and curse you because you should have had before you the vivid image of Jesus Christ crucified. And now this, this is very, uh, very, uses very graphic language. Uh, clearly portrayed means that he vividly portrayed Jesus for them. Uh, some have even said that maybe he used some sort of visual arts type thing, which I don't think he had to. The word itself does not mean visual arts. It actually means uh, prographo is the Greek word, which means something portrayed uh, vividly before someone else. Uh, oh, question. Yeah. Um, weren't these Galatians actual witnesses to the crucifixion of Christ? No. No. This oh, is not. The, the letter to the Galatians is written around 50 AD. That's uh, already about 17 years after the crucifixion and resurrection okay. of Jesus Christ. So no, they would not. Uh, I'm not even sure they would have heard about him. Uh, now, they would have seen many crucifixions. So they know what a crucifixion, you know, uh, they, mm -hmm. it's, not like, it's not like if I'm, like I'm teaching someone, I have to teach them what a crucifixion looks like. And I, you know, tell them, okay, it was like this. Thank God today, in this Thursday, I mean, you know, all kidding aside, I'm very grateful for Mel Gibson's movie because it's the most vivid portrayal of a crucifixion. Um, I, I was amazed when I saw it. I said, oh, my goodness, he really, he really brought out just how vicious a crucifixion is. So, and these people are used to this because, again, Christ was crucified outside the city in, in, uh, in Golgotha, in the Mount of Golgotha, most people were actually crucified right where they lived. So like I, like I used the illustration, like if I had committed a crime against Rome and Rome really wanted to send a message to people in Cliffside Park, they would crucify me and put me right in the middle of Cliffside Park. So that when you were going to the grocery store or you're going here, or you're going to go see a movie, you're going to, you would see me there crucified. Yeah, <laughs> and then, that's why they... Uh the uh, Spartacus and the, uh, all the uh, slaves or rebel were crucified along the Via Appia, so yeah. the whole Roman Empire would see it. That's um, right. The, uh, I didn't see the movie, uh, you know, Mel Gibson movie. Was he, was, was, uh, was Christ carrying his cross in that movie? I think he does it correctly. He, he has, the, uh, I can't remember, I'm trying to remember now, but I think he does begin to carry and then uh, he only carries the portion, the one piece, not the, yeah, whole the, the horizontal beam. 
Yeah, the bean. And because the upright was already. And of course, then he, brings in, he brings in Simon to. Right. The Cyrene. To to, to, but to some carry. other movies incorrectly have him carrying the whole cross. Yeah, not this one. This one he's carrying only. Which is bean. good. Which, which that's correct. Uh, again, I, I think he. he you know, he, he did his he did his research very 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 well. Good. And I, even, and I even looked up certain things about it because I was so curious um, uh, about you know how he got this done. But he you know he did his research. He did a very good job. And again, the only thing I remember it, the first person I actually talked to me about the movie I hadn't seen it yet was my uh, uh, my mailman, and he asked me you know and I when he described it to me. I said, probably the only thing missing, and that was probably done out of courtesy, is that um, they didn't have Jesus naked on the cross, completely naked. Right, because... The Romans, would have, had, the Romans would have had him completely naked. Right. Because the whole thing was shame, disgrace, uh, to humiliate you uh, as much as possible. That's why the king of the Jews was to humiliate the Jews, to insult them, to... This is what this is the... They, this is an art form for the, for the, for the Romans. They, they took pleasure... Um, and this is why people say, well, you know, after the beating that Christ received, how come he didn't die? Because they were very good executioners. They knew how to torture you to a point where you could have died, but they knew they needed to keep you alive so they wouldn't yeah. go all the way. The 39 lashes. If it didn't matter, then they could go all the way and you might end up being killed even before you get crucified. Yeah. In this as, case, I, in this as, case, I as I remember, they took the crucifixion from the uh, Iranians. Yeah. Because Persia, one, yeah. he, they thought that uh, a criminal should not be allowed to touch the ground, so it was lifted up. Yeah. So they got that and they took it to another level, of course. Although, although I think the Persians did it through impalement, right? They didn't do it through, not like the Romans crucified or like this. They they actually impaled you with the with the. Spirit. Well, first they, I guess, sometimes they, first they would kill you and then they would impale you, but sometimes they would just impale you without killing you first. Horrible. Yeah, but it was, it, it did come from the Persians, yeah. Vicious, vicious people. And uh, so, yeah, they, they, yeah, again, this is, for, for the Galatians, this is not a weird thing. This is very common. Um, and again... It's, a, it's well, a common execution, okay. Yeah, they would have seen many executions. Uh, they would have seen people in, in their own communities who had, who had uh, gone against Rome. They would, be, they would be crucified right there and then. So they would have seen this, this. So they knew. So when, when Paul uh, vividly portrays uh, Christ crucified, he doesn't have to use like a visual aid. You know, he doesn't have to take a picture and draw it or, you know, here's, you know, here's something. I, I want to get to an issue about, about that too, because somebody in Facebook said that to me, said, said the dumbest thing, but, uh, <laughs> and I know really, I, I don't know. I, I just, I, I, I don't get it. I, you know, I, I, on Facebook, it's like, it's the garbage. It's amazing how people just just say whatever they think. Um, but vividly portrays me that he preached Christ. He so well illustrated what it meant that Christ went through. That they should have had that image vividly in their minds. So mm -hmm. when they have these false teachers coming in trying to fool them, they should have been able to see Christ crucified. You know, just like the author of Hebrews says, you know, keep your eyes on Christ, you know, as you're running the race, you know, keep that vivid. So Paul has, to, again, no problem saying, you know, visualize, visualize Jesus on the cross dying for your sins. And that will keep you from trying to earn your own salvation and follow the law or, or follow the flesh. Um, but actually, when I when I was dealing with this passage online, uh, it was an early church history group. And somebody used this to to try to promote icons. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know if you, do you know what icons are, you guys. Yeah. Know? Okay. Icons, Eastern Orthodox, they use actual graphic sure. things that are, you know, carved into wood and they actually pray to them. They use them for meditation. Um, and this guy was trying to portray this word as being icon. And, and I said, that doesn't make sense on any level. I said, first of all, Paul is a Jew. Jews are anti-images. Jews don't use images. Any image for a Jew becomes dangerous because it can end up being something you end up worshiping instead except, of God. Except the Messianic Church, they you they do use images, a little, a little things that they sell, you know, yeah. like a 
like uh, the uh, menorah, yeah. uh, like uh, the cross of David, mm-hmm. and a bunch of other things that they sell, you know, for the you know, the uh, the Messianic Church. But of I, course, not the real, you know, Old Testament I, Jews. I am so anti-image. I really am. I, see, that's why that's why I laugh because if I was if I had went into a Messianic Church, I'd be like, wow, I'm more Hebrew than they are, because I'm very anti-image. The only reason I permit images is for children. Because I know mm-hmm. children need pictures to see stories about the Bible and stuff like that. But when I first came to this church, they were about one, two, three, four, about four or five pictures of Jesus in the church. You know, one with him and children, one with him at like a supper. You know, slowly I took them out of the church. I made them disappear. <laughs> uh, I, you know, at first I would move one to one place from one place to another. Mm. So nobody even noticed that I moved it. They didn't notice I would take it away. And slowly all the images, <clears throat> even in my office, there were two images. Uh, the pastor before me had two, two portraits of Christ. And no, 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 those, those, those came down without any problem because no one, that's my office. I'm not going to have images uh, of Jesus. Yeah, one of the uh, parishioners gave us, uh, I guess like a year ago, a picture of the Last Supper, you know, mm-hmm. Da Vinci, and uh, and Ratio was saying, "What are we going to do with this? You know, we're going to have to throw it out." Uh, of course, disappear because uh, they they I guess they meant well, but uh, they they had no idea that that's yeah. that's an image, yeah. even an incorrect image. Yeah. See, yeah. I don't, I don't, I just don't like images because sure. they there's become, no need. They become the central thing. Like you know, when you have an image, sometimes people, for example, even when they're praying. They might end up looking at that thing, sure. your friend, and somehow they begin to associate that thing with God, uh, and it's not God. Yep. Uh, so again, I'm very, but I, you know, but I try to explain to them that for a first century Jew, so you know, so of course they bring up the the issue of uh, that there were synagogues that have carvings on it, and I said yes, synagogue in Hellenistic places had there was like two examples of that. I said, but that was not the norm. Uh, and that was actually, you can tell, it was a much more liberal type uh, Jew. I said, Paul is a very strict Jew. And for, and for him to actually be, used, and I said, I, I, oh, so then what I did was I found um, the word uh, prographo appears like in four different places in the New Testament by Paul, three, three places by Paul. The fourth one, I think, is in the book of James or Hebrews. And so mm-hmm. I went to, I said, so uh, here is the one talking about Christ. The other one was talking about uh, the mystery of the, of the gospel to Gentiles. The other one was talking about the Old Testament. I said, what? this?" So did Paul have three icons that he carried around? Uh, and he didn't answer me that. Because now I'm stupid. Now you're telling me that everywhere Paul goes, he's carrying these icons. You know? Uh, mm-hmm. And I said, it's a, it's a miracle that when he was, <clears throat> he was in prison, he never said, please bring me my icons. Right. He said, bring my writings. But he never asked for his icons. I mean, he didn't have icons. This, this is a, this icon started around the third, fourth century, and, and in the Eastern Church, not the Western Church. The Western Church had images, but they had images for other reasons. Um, they had images for legitimate reasons. The, the reason was that most people in the ancient world were illiterate. And so the Western Church had mm-hmm. images so that people could see the stories of Jesus, you know, like the Stations of the Cross. They would have those carvings and stuff, so people would know and know the story by the images, and so that's why they used them because most people were illiterate; they didn't know how to read. So it's not like, you know, it's not like everybody had a book. They, you know, uh, printing was not a was not a was not there yet. So any book right. was like by copying it, and and the liter- uh, literary people were very uh, minor. You know, like a small a small group of people who knew how to read. Most people didn't, so. Even when Paul wrote his letters, uh, it wasn't like he wrote, he made copies for every person in the church. He only made one copy. And then the person who was carrying the letter was the person that Paul dictated the letter to. He would, he would explain the letter to him. And then when they took the letter to the place, they would act it out. They would, you know, say it the way Paul wanted to be said. They would read it the way Paul wanted to be read. Uh, again, because they were, they were not they were not literary people, so very precise. But here, I was I found it funny that somebody would even dare to say that uh, this is icons. Paul Paul would never condone icons. Mm-hmm. And now, yeah. I, I don't care if we condone them in our in our culture. You know, you want to you want to sell trinkets in a church. You want to you know you do whatever you want to. 
but but don't read that into a New Testament. I hate when people do that. You know, yeah. I'm a Baptist. I love being a Baptist. I don't have to read my Baptist tradition into Paul and make Paul out of to be a Baptist. Uh, he's not a Baptist. On the contrary, he's maybe more like him. Uh, if people look at me as a Baptist, they'd be like, oh, why are you so much against images? Well, I had Paul as my teacher. And Paul made me very anti-image. He's maybe he's made me very Hebrew in the way that I think. So I tend to be more like Paul. Uh, yeah, I remember when I, the first time I went to a Baptist church was when I was working in Virginia and some guy invited me to his church. And I was so impressed. It was not a single image. In that. It was a big church, a huge church, you know, out there in the South. And there was not a single image around. The only thing was a, a, a quote from Isaiah. Mm -hmm. That's all it was. And then the pulpit. And the pulpit was carved across. That's yes. all. And then the preacher was a guy with a, with a tie and with a Bible. So the simplicity of the whole thing is what impressed me a lot. Now, the church that I came to know the Lord was a Baptist church, Southern Baptist. Uh, and they did have a portrait in the back of Jesus, the Good Shepherd, a painting. Uh, but the reason they had that was because we're no longer living in the age where people... Um, you know, like this church, this church was started by Baptists. It is a Baptist church. Um, but the church where I came to know the Lord, it was a Southern Baptist congregation that bought a church from a congregation that was dying and mm -hmm. they left it. And so that portrait was there when they first bought the property. So they didn't have the heart <laughs> to remove it. It was actually part of this. It's actually part like ours. Like, you know, we have the baptismal thing in the back. Uh, that drawing there, that painting. Uh, and that was done by one of our parishioners. Uh, so they had that there and they, they felt, you know, but I remember my pastor many times would mention now we don't worship images, we don't have images. And and uh, looking at the background saying we only have this here because of whatever, blah, blah, blah. So maybe I also got it because of the fact that I am Baptist, but Paul is very anti-image. Um, and to think that he would have icons, it, yeah. it's, it's ludicrous. But again, why do we need to read back into Paul what's not there? Oh, I'll give you a good example. I, I, Paul, uh, Southern Baptists are very anti-tongues. Uh, you know, right. I, came, I came to know the Lord in, in church where the pastors that tongues were of the devil, that they were not of God, that they had mm -hmm. ceased, blah, blah, blah. I don't believe that because I've, I've studied the word of God. Uh, I've studied the writings of Paul. And uh, yeah, tongues is there. So why should I deny it? Uh, I don't have to. So, but again... We shouldn't read our ideas into 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 the first century. You know, just like I told Juliet, because uh, I remember the congregation she came from. Uh, they did the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Yeah, that's the way the early church did it. We don't do it that way. We do it once a month. The early mm -hmm. church did communion every single time they met. Every Sunday when they gathered together for worship, uh, they would have their service. Then they would have a, a, a like a festive fellowship meal, and then they would celebrate the Lord's Supper. You know that was just part of their routine. Mm -hmm. um, but again, we don't. Have, I don't have to follow. We we never told that we have to follow it that way. Uh, you know, or that we have to speak these precise words or do this. You know, hocus pocus type thing with the Lord's Supper. So we don't. We have freedom when it comes to those things. But I'm not going to say, oh no, in the early church they did it once. A, they did it once a month. No, they didn't. They, they did it uh, every Sunday mm -hmm. and, and they, and they used actual wine. They didn't use uh, grape juice. You know, that's why, why do I want to change? Why do I want to change? Yeah. Why do I want to change the history of the church? Just let it be, you know, there's no, there's no, uh, there's, it's not a, it's not a, it's not an issue that is dogmatic. You know, like Paul says, one of those things that are indifferent, like uh, Romans 14, where he says, there are things that are neutral. They're gray. Uh, they're not important. And it doesn't matter, you know, what you hold to that. There are things that are important. There are things that are, uh, in, what's the word he uses? I, I see it in the Greek, but I can't, like indifferent, not, not, mm -hmm. not, uh, not dogmatic. Any question? All right, let's go to verse two. I would, like, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by believing what you heard? Uh, the spirit, of course, is the guarantee of the inheritance. Uh, as in Romans chapter 8, verses uh, 23, and 2 Corinthians, and also in Ephesians. Uh, the word for guarantee is arabon, a down payment, the first installment in the, con in the contract. The present gift of the Holy Spirit to us 
is the advanced foretaste of the ultimate new creation, the down payment of the inheritance. That's going to become a big issue for Paul when he talks about we are the heirs of Abraham. Uh, who is the heir? Is it the, the Jewish people by physical lineage or is it the, the church by spiritual lineage? And he's going to say it's the church are the true heirs, uh, the true children uh, of Abraham. Although he never uses true, he never uses the word true. He just says, we are the heirs. We are the circumcision. We are the ones, period. He doesn't, have, he doesn't need to make a contrast. So again, the Holy Spirit is, the, is that first uh, installment. So right now, the Holy Spirit is actually given to us as a guarantee that Christ is going to come back and that we belong to him and that we will finally be his. Uh, so again, that, that, can, that sense of security for us. Uh, and of course, he climaxes, climaxes in chapter four, verse six and seven, he says, because you are sons, God sent out the spirit of his son into our hearts, calling out Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if you're a son, you're an heir through God. That is very deep theology for Paul. And we're going to get into that more in detail. But of course, it's all connected to the Exodus. It's all connected to being children of Abraham. You know, you, you, you have gone from slavery uh, out, out of the bondage you're in. Now that you're in the land that God, the place where God wants you, now he looks at you as a son, as a daughter, as a child, mm -hmm. no longer a slave in Egypt, no longer a slave to the past, your, your child. And therefore, all, all believers are part of that inheritance. All believers are heirs to Abraham, not simply the Jews and not simply the Gentiles. Um, this is the point. Paul is not saying You've had this wonderful spiritual experience. So why, sh why should you want to go back and practice the law as well? He's telling them by having the spirit, they are already members of God's family and don't need anything else. They don't need the law. Once you have the spirit of God, you are a child of God, period. Mm -hmm. There is nothing you can add to that. There is nothing you can have that will make you more a child of God than having the Holy Spirit. This is why Paul is baffled. Uh, he had been with them. He had preached the gospel to them. He had made it so clear to them. And yet here they are going back into, into this mindset because of the people who are talking to them. Uh, of course, Paul is funny because Paul is always very funny. We just don't pick up on the humor. But think about it. He declares that he has only one question for them. But when you read verse one as well, it really is asking six questions. Uh, who has bewitched them? Was their reception of the spirit through the gospel message or faith or through works of the law? Are they really so foolish? Having begun with the spirit and now they, are they going to end in the flesh? Have they suffered so much pain for nothing? Uh, does God distribute the powerful spirit to, to and through them by law works or by hearing the faith? Uh, with everything that has happened to them, since the day Paul came to town and told them about Jesus, has any of, the, any of it happened because they were keeping the Jewish law? So he says, all these things that you've gotten, you came to know Christ, you experienced the fullness of the Holy Spirit, you experienced the blessings of the Holy Spirit, you experienced the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Did any of this come to you because you were following the law? Mm. The answer, of course, absolutely is not. No. So think about me. That's why it has to baffle you even today. When people who have tasted the Holy Spirit, who've been born again, who have the gifts of the Holy Spirit, now feel that they need, they need to supplement their faith with something else. I mean, that's like me saying, well, you know, I, I, know, that I, and I know that I have Christ in my life. I, I've had all these blessings from the Lord. Let me take on Judaism. Let me take on the law so my mm -hmm. spirituality will become greater. It just, it's nonsensical. Your spirituality cannot become greater. You already have every blessing in Jesus Christ, through Christ, in you. There's, you know, there, there, there is nothing. If you want to go and, and grow in the richness of your spiritual faith, then spend more time in the Word. Spend more time in prayer. Spend more time in fellowship. But that's it. There's nothing like, there's not like a, like a Gnostic thing, something you have to go and, oh, there's, a, there's a, a, a secret knowledge that only certain people have, and I have to go get it. Or uh, there's a certain level of experience that only certain people experience, and I, I have to go get that. Anything that one Christian has, every Christian has. 
because we have everything in Jesus Christ. Uh, and yet here they are. They already have all this. I mean, that's why it has to has to amaze us when a person comes to the Lord. They have all these things in church already. And then they feel that they have to add the yoke of the law into their lives. And I do mean the yoke. Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine when I see these when I see these Gentiles. Let me be even more precise. My Hispanic brothers and sisters <laughs> becoming Jewish. And now they have to do Shabbat, and now they have to stay away from certain foods, and, and now they cannot they cannot be on the internet at a certain hour because now Shabbat started, and I cannot. Oh, they know that. <laughs> oh yeah, that's something I never heard of that too. Oh, never heard that yeah. either. Once Shabbat is coming, that's it. Really? You know, you, know, you stay away from work, you stay away from this. It's all about prayer and meditation, you know, and going to church. Uh, Oh, I mean, I, I guess I, I don't know if, if all Messianic Jews like that, but the ones that I've encountered, uh, some are more free, like Jonathan. I know somebody from Jonathan Kahn's congregation. He does, he's not like that. He's mm -hmm. just, and again, they're Hispanics. I, that, I mean, I'm sorry. I know. I, 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 they're Hispanic. They're Hispanics. Like, Dude, you're Spanish. You're not a Jew. I told you, when I, when I went to a visit to Peru a few years ago, and I went to a, a you know, a, Messianic congregations, more than one, they were really radical. I mean, they will greet you like a uh, Shabbat Shalom, you know, the, that was their, and uh, some of them, they had uh, the men sitting up front and the women in the back. You see? Um, yeah, I mean, oh, they, 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 every year there was, a, there was another step. Wow. You know, yeah. It's almost like they think they're, they think they're rediscovering their faith. Yeah. And actually they're moving further and further away from their faith. Because faith in Christ breaks down the barriers. You know, we're going to deal with it in chapter 3. We yep. get to verse 28. In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, male nor female, slave nor free. When we get together as a congregation, we come together as one. Not separated into different cultures and all oh, Jews over here, you know, uh, Gentiles over here, women over here, men over here, slaves over here. No, no, we're all brothers and sisters. We're all one. Uh, and mm -hmm. yet these things are recreating the barriers. You know, and I, I, one of the things that really uh, triggered me was when um, a lady that was in this church went, and again, she, she loved that whole messianic stuff, but I, I'm glad she got a, she got a rough lesson. Because <laughs> she went down to Florida to retire. She went down to Florida and she decided to start attending a messianic church and she became a Sunday school teacher. Really? And she was teaching a class. Now, this lady's American. She's, I think she, I can't think of, I think her background is Italian or something like that. Okay. And this congregation, there was uh, the class she was teaching was for kids. And this Spanish girl, a little Spanish girl, I don't know what background was Spanish, but she was Spanish. Because um, she said, oh, Jesus, da, da, da. says, no, 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 it's Yeshua. Yep. His name is not Jesus, it's Yeshua. Yep. And yes. oh, my goodness. And so she was like, no, his name is Jesus. You can say Jesus. And she, the little girl was so upset, she went and talked to the rabbi. Because they're not pastors, they're rabbis. Oh, right. the rabbis. Yeah. Yeah, they call their they call their pastor rabbi. They, they don't call they, pastor. Yeah, they oh, change rabbi. they change their uh, name to uh, from pastor to rabbi. Yeah, so she yeah. went to talk to a rabbi, and oh. I don't know what nationality he was, and he rebuked her. He rebuked really? the woman and suspended her from teaching because she was using the name Jesus rather than Yeshua. And I said to her, you know, the bad thing is that obviously that congregation is incredibly ignorant. Because the New Testament is written in Greek, not in Aramaic. But well, they're not alone. They're not alone. They're not alone at all. Yeah. Like I said, I, when I went to Peru and I went to this this uh, friend of mine that I know, you know, he was a pastor, a very good pastor. But then he went step by step more into the uh, Messianic uh, thing. And one day he went to the congregation. He said, from this point on, I will not, I will not say the name Jesus anymore. I will say the name Yeshua. And of course, people in the congregation were saying, what about all those people that got salvation saying the name of Jesus? You know, what about those? What about well, he didn't have an answer for that. You know, <laughs> he didn't have an answer for that. What but, about uh, all those, all those, everybody all was shocked. Guys in the name of Jesus. <laughs> everybody was shocked in the congregation. There were about, you know, 20 of us. And everybody was against him, you know. Can you do that? But he would not dissuade because he got his own congregation and all that. He also said once that uh, if you don't tie, you know, 10 percent, uh, you should not come to this church. There you go. There you go. I heard that 
myself. I would have been like, no problem, brother. Take care. <laughs> See you later, Raboni. <laughs> yeah. um, no, but even even the, the name of Jesus, that's what amazed me. Again, first of all, they, they'll say that the New Testament is written Aramaic. This is a lie. I hate the fact that they even have an Aramaic New Testament. That is a pure creation of somebody. Somebody took the Greek New Testament and translated it into Aramaic. We don't have okay. every, we don't have any Aramaic New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote their gospels in Greek. Paul, which is the first writings of the New Testament, are all in Greek. The book of Revelation, James, Peter, all those books are in Greek. Not one of them was written in Aramaic. Now, do they speak Aramaic in their everyday life? It, Jesus would have. And um, Hebrew. Uh, some, some scattering of Hebrew, and Hebrew is mostly in the synagogue when you're reading the scriptures. When you're reading the scriptures, they're in Hebrew. There is some Aramaic in the scriptures, but they're primarily Hebrew. But the language spoken by Jesus' disciples was Aramaic. Okay. But the language, for example, that Paul spoke in was Greek. Paul knew his Aramaic because obviously he's, he's Jewish. So he knew Aramaic. But he knew Greek, which was the common language. The, the, you know, it's like saying we live, in, we live in America. America is the common language that we right. all We hear. have different, oh, we different might, languages. We yeah. might have Spanish or Japanese or whatever right. we speak on the side. But we have English as the main core. Greek was the main core. When the Gospels and the writings of Paul are written, they're written in Greek because you're trying to reach people. And mm -hmm. there, the name is not Yeshua. It's Jesus, if you're going to get technical. Mm -hmm. And apparently Paul, Peter, James, John had no problem calling Yeshua Jesus. Because that was the Greek version of mm -hmm. Jesus. Uh, again, it's, they, they're, they're trying to be more religious, more spiritual than Paul, more yeah. spiritual than Peter, more <laughs> spiritual than James and John. It's ludicrous. It's ludicrous. And that's why we have to know. That's why we need to know our Bibles. That's why we need to know these things. Because... It's just pure. I said to her, you know, sweetie, uh, you should know that it's all written in Greek, no matter what they tell you. Uh, you can study it. You can search it out for yourself. You can read books about this. It's all, it's, all we have is Greek manuscripts. We don't have, the only evidence we have of some possible Aramaic is by Papias, who said that uh, Matthew had originally written his gospel in Aramaic, and that it was translated into Greek. But we, but, don't have, but we don't have a Aramaic copy. A copy. But uh, Yeshua HaMashiach is Hebrew, right? Yeah, Hebrew. No, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's Aramaic. That's, that's, no, that's a proper way of saying Aramaic. Uh, Yeshua HaMashiach. Uh, I thought it was Hebrew. It might be. But that, that, that would be the, the proper way of saying it. In Aramaic, right. that would be the proper way of saying it. But it they say Aramaic. that all the time in, uh, in the uh, Beth Israel. Yeshua mm -hmm. HaMashiach. That was constantly saying it. Yeah. Constantly referring to Jesus. They, they, they probably feel so cute that they know some little Hebrew. Yeah. They throw he out. was so cool. Yeah. You know? he, I he, thought he was cool too. Uh, you know. But Separate again, me from the rest. <laughs> but then again, when you cross that line and now, see, talk about, let's talk about images again. Here, yeah. We're going to be able to, as a preacher, I can come back to things. Talk about images. You all suddenly you make the name a sacred name. Right. It's something like, special. You end up worshiping the name. Like somehow, you, you, this is a magical name for Jesus. And if you use this name, you're talking to the real Jesus. And you're saying the real Jesus name. I mean, this is why, this is why the, he, the Hebrew vowels of Yahweh are missing. <laughs> and all we right. have is a tetragram, the four, the four consonants. Because humans tend to worship things. Mm -hmm. You know, you give them a Bible and instead of saying, oh, wow, this, this is the Bible. Let me read it. They end up worshiping the book. No, this is the Bible. Well, careful where you put it. Well, oh, the, uh, they might not read it anymore, but careful, put it over here, you know. The, the people that belong to Messianic churches, when they write emails, they never write the, the word God, especially in Spanish. They write the, the eternal yeah. one. You know, they avoid totally writing the word God. Yeah. Well, actually, see, there, there they fail, and, and I'm shocked that even, uh, that even Jonathan, Rabbi, Rabbi Jonathan Khan, 
I would think that he would know the Hebrew tradition. Uh, in Hebrew, uh, when I was translating the Hebrew scriptures, I took Hebrew and uh, for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And when I had to translate the Hebrew scriptures, you know, my, my professor who was taught by rabbis, um, he would not let me pronounce the holy name. But I, I would not say God. When I came to the word Yahweh, I would have to say Adonai. Okay. So that, that is the, the appropriate way. Means if you really want to get technical, when you're going to write the name of God, you don't write the name of God, you put Adonai. Uh, but G D is, is a modern thing. God is not, God is not the name <laughs> of God. In the Old Testament, people use many words. The, actually, God in the Old Testament is the word Elohim. Okay. That's, Elohim. that's the general name for God, Elohim. Yahweh is the personal name of God. And that's okay. the one you're not supposed to write down or pronounce uh so again they if they, if they want to get really technical mm. you know that's the way it goes but they don't they don't get they think that somehow god is the holy god is not the holy name of god god is a generic name right but you know allah is god right there are many gods sure you know people believe in zeus as a god that's a that's a generic name that's not the the name of god According Yahweh, to, according to Shudder McLean, we are gods. Yeah. I mean, so again, God is a general term yeah. that can refer to many things. If you want to, you know, like if someone said, I believe in God, you would ask them, which God? Because just to say right. you believe in God doesn't mean you believe in the God of the Bible. You know, uh, you would have to ask them. So uh, again, very. But this is the stupidity that we have gotten into, into in our society where. Um, what is it? What is the book of? Uh, I think it's Malachi. Is it Malachi? Uh, my people, my people die because of the lack of the knowledge of the word of God. Uh, yeah. It's like people are people are perishing because they really don't know the, the scriptures. They don't know the traditions. They don't know anything. Uh, they just basically kind of go with whatever their pastor is saying. And if he goes off on a tangent, you know, that's why you know even as a pastor, I'm very careful that it. Um, I preach the gospel and I preach the main core of what the gospel is. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to compromise the gospel for anybody. I'm not going to, I'm not going to make the church Jewish or Pentecostal or anything, or even Baptist. I'm going to make it evangelical. I'm going to keep it to the word of God. Um, and, and, and not, and I have never changed. Once I understood the gospel and understood what it meant, on the contrary, I became much more dogmatic as time went by because I realized these people, these people are off on tangents, and they're they're creating little cults. They're creating little uh, little groups within the within the body of Christ. And we shouldn't be creating little groups. We should be working mm -hmm. together. You know, uh, I should I should be able to say to you, hey, if you want to say Meshua, Hamashiach, go hey, <laughs> go for it. But don't tell me I can't say Jesus. And, you know, it doesn't bother me that you say Hashem. You can say whatever you want to, and you can pray to him that way. That's fine. Uh, but don't make that name. A god, a icon. You know, I remember. I remember one time I was reading a, a commentary on Deuteronomy. Uh, who was the author? He said it so well. He said about making images of God. He said, if you sit down and you start writing a definition of God, and you think that is God, that's an idol. You cannot put God in a box. God is God, and you worship Him. But you don't try to create any image of him and think that somehow he has to fit into your image. Uh, you have to listen to his word and listen to what, who he says he is, not into what you think he is. And again, to, to put a name like Yeshua Mahamashiach when nobody in the Testament has a problem. Again, Peter, James, John, who are very Hebrew, much more Hebrew than Paul, because Paul was, did not deal with Jewish people the way they did. They had no problem calling Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. So we should have no problem either. Mm -hmm. But again, it's, it's the nonsense that we live in. Any, any questions? Mm -hmm. All right, let's tackle verse three. Are you so foolish? Again, <laughs> after beginning by means of spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? And here I want you to see a real correlation. Let me read it better from the Bible. So I don't have to look back at the verse in my notes. Notice that in verse 2, he says, did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by what you heard? That's mm -hmm. the contract. Works of the law, what you heard. And now he says, 
After beginning by the spirit, are you not trying to finish by the flesh? Notice that he does it here, and he'll do it again, and he'll bring it back when he comes to chapter 5 especially. He associates the law with the flesh. That's amazing. Mm. You know, the flesh, which is that which is contrary to God, that which stands in opposition to God, he puts the law there. and says, if you're following the law, you are following the flesh. You're trying to acquire a rightness with God by some other means than by faith in Jesus Christ. And therefore, you're, you're working with the flesh. Uh, so very, very, uh, very important. And again, he's going to make this contrast, too, when it comes to the flesh, because in, in chapter 4, verse 21, uh, he's going to deal with uh, Sarah and Hagar. Mm -hmm. and again, bringing the issue of the spirit and the flesh. What child are you? Are you a child of the spirit or a child of the flesh? And again, those who were boasting in the, in the genealogy of their flesh, which I've seen that also when it comes to those who are Jewish today, or try to say I'm from the tribe of this, I'm the tribe of that, and like, I'm like, uh, who cares what tribe you're from? You know, I'm from the tribe of Jesus. You know, it's like, really, what's wrong with you? I mean, first of all, I don't know how anybody today can say that they're from the tribe of anything, because when the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D., uh, all the records of genealogy were destroyed. So today, to have a Jew really tell you, I'm from the line, or I'm from the from this, from this, or from that. That's that's sixty percent hogwash, right there. I would tell you right now. Mm -hmm. I, I I would not believe that at all, because that that was like you know, it, it just like you know, just like uh, when Jonathan Kahn was talking about the jubilee, and that uh, how the the jubilee of jubilees were come on, on this year, that year, there was a Jewish man who was interviewing him and said the jubilee the jews stopped celebrating jubilee so we don't know when the last jubilee was right so there's no way you can know the next 50 years the next 50 you really don't know when the jubilee lands because you don't know the jubilee anymore and, right. he, and he had to admit on camera i said you can go to you can google it on youtube he had to admit that he did not really know you know, hmm. and I can't remember what hogwash he said to say that how he estimated it was that it was this year, that year. But hmm. there's no way of telling because those again, that line was broken. All those things were broken. Uh, and yet people are still trying to connect. Because it's not them. important anymore. Yeah. But again, some some people try to boast in the flesh. I'm an actual child of Abraham. I'm, you know, and Paul, of course, will will mock it here. In China, and, 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 which is funny because Paul is Jewish. Mm -hmm. and Paul says in Philippians 3, which I can't wait till we get to that also. In Philippians 3, he says, I'm a Jew of the Jew. I'm a Hebrew. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I'm a Pharisee. I'm this. I'm that. I was, I'm from the tribe of Gen Benjamin. And he said, and you know what that means to me? Kaka. He mm -hmm. literally says, that's dung. That's manure. That means nothing to me compared to knowing Jesus Christ. That I love. That is the, the way it's supposed to be. When I look, if, if I was to say, well, you know, my, my great-grandfather was General so-and-so, and my mother was this, and my dad was that, and I came from this heritage. But you know what? All that means nothing to me. The only thing that means anything to me is knowing Jesus. That is amazing. And mm. so when you see people say boasting about their Jewish heritage as Christians, I mean, I, Jews, I can expect that that's what they would do. But when you see a Christian trying to say, I, I'm from this line, I'm this, and I'm, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews, I'm like, Dude, you're actually boasting in the very things that Paul says we should not boast in, that we should boast in the cross, that we should boast, boast in Christ, boast in the fact that we're suffering for Jesus. You know, he says, I want to know Christ and, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. That's that's tremendous. That's the way mm -hmm. exactly what it should be. Uh, and people miss out on it because they're they're so fixated. They're actually bringing back the things that Paul would say we should not be bringing back. To make those kind of distinctions, uh, but again, here here's a point where they they started out with the spirit. Are you going to finish with the flesh? You know, you started out by believing in Jesus Christ. Salvation is only by Him, and now you're trying to add something to it. You're going to try to add some sort of yeah. you know, somehow become physically in the line of Abraham. And of course, for the Gentiles to do that, 
they would have to, well, the males would have to circumcise themselves and become full-blown uh, followers uh, of Judaism, mm -hmm. so, uh, which that is ludicrous. I, I, you know, which I, I, you know, today, of course, most males are circumcised. So uh, they don't have to worry about that. You know, they, when they were babies, they were circumcised. But I, I can imagine anybody who's not saying, really? You want to follow Judaism? You want to get circumcised? Really? Good luck on that one. You yeah. know, ain't going to happen, baby. Uh, but again, this is, the, this is the folly of where we live. And, and again, the flesh, the flesh is that which stands in opposition to, to God. And Paul's going to say in, Philippi, in, uh, in Galatians 5, what the real deeds of the flesh are and what people who follow the flesh follow and those who follow spirit, their behavior and their character and what they follow. Uh, and, and just a huge contrast there. Any questions? Mm -mm. He says in verse four, have you experienced so much in vain? If it really was in vain, uh, Paul sharpens the challenge here. The Galatians have already suffered persecution. Again, how ludicrous it is. You became a Christian, you accepted Christ, and because you became a Christian, your neighbors were against you. People did not like you because, again, when a person became a Christian, they stopped worshiping the gods of the nation. They no longer worshiped the emperor. They no longer worshiped local gods. They no longer worshiped family gods. Uh, so, I mean, we, you know, when, when a Gentile today is different, <laughs> but when a Gentile became a Christian back then, he gave up worshiping a lot of gods. Uh, the ancient people worshiped a lot of gods. They had their, their own family gods, uh, their, the gods of their village or their town, the gods of, of, their, uh, of their community, the larger community, the god of, uh, of Rome, all the gods that Rome worshiped, including the emperor. And they literally stopped associating with all that. And so people ostracized them and persecuted them. Uh, many Christians lost their jobs. They lost their livelihood. Um, they were not permitted to be part of certain, uh, you know, like back then they had, just like today, we have a, a what do you call them? Oh, when, pe when workers get together and they have a... Fellowship? No, 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 workers. I can't remember, I can't think of the name. Um, like, let's say, oh, you know, you work for this company and you are a part of a local whatever. Union? Union, thank you. Oh, my goodness, can't think of union. Uh, they would have something like that, like guilds. Union. Okay. And so you, let's say, you know, you were a carpenter. You were part of a union. But those carpenters worshipped certain gods. You know, maybe okay. gods, gods that were creative or whatever, you know, artistic or whatever. So you stop worshipping those gods they would not let you be bar part of that guild anymore. You were not part of that union. So now how can you find work? You know, that's why in, in the book of Hebrews, especially the author brings out how many Christians were losing their jobs. They lost their property. They ended up in jail because they would not worship the gods. And so Paul says, you're telling me you went through all that. You suffered all that persecution for Jesus. And now you think that you need something else to 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 be right with god you know then all that you did was in vain you didn't have to go through all that you, all you had to do was say i'm jewish and the jews were exempt from all those things so he says that if you did all that suffering then you did it in vain because mm -hmm. you didn't need to you could just have claimed to be a jew if you converted to judaism you didn't have to worship the emperor you didn't have to worship the local gods they gave you a great deal of exemptions, uh, and yet the Christians were not taking those exemptions because they were not Jewish, because they were Christians. Um, and he says, you went through all that for what? For no reason at all, then. <laughs> Any other questions? Right, let's, uh, let's do one more verse, verse 5, and then we'll, next week we'll start with verse 6 because uh, it, it gets, it gets uh, we get deeper into verse 6. So let's just do verse 5. So again, I ask you, does God, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? The sharp little paragraph reaches its climax with a repetition of the opening question, only now reinforced with an emphasis on the fact that it is God himself who distributes his spirit to them and who works deeds of power in their midst. 
Uh, the word for distributes may carry the sense of a benefactor handing out gifts. The word for God's working of the deeds of power is the same as in chapter 2, verse 8, where Paul talks about God working through his and Peter's ministry. So he asks, did God only uh, do those signs in the beginning, those features of the already inaugurated kingdom, because they were because you were trying to keep the Jewish law? Was God working miracles and doing all these wonderful things for you and giving you all these spiritual gifts because you were trying to keep the law? Or because you had believed in Jesus, because you had kept the spirit? Of course, the, the rhetorical question answers itself. The obvious answer implied and, uh, answer leads, of course, to the main discussion that will follow in verse 6. Of course, it was through the message to be heard by faith. Very well, then this puts us, puts us on the map with Abraham, who also was a man of faith, who lived by faith, not by work of the law, and did not go, uh, God worked many great things in him, and he did not have the law either. And he's going to connect that to verse 6. But again, God gave us all his gifts. God worked all his miracles on our lives. He didn't do it because we were following Torah. He didn't do it because we had, we had become Jews. He did it because we had accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, because we were following him and believing in him. Uh, and he says, why are you, are you turning to me? I, I really, I, to me, the first five verses already are so powerful to make them reflect upon their own Christian experience and how they came to faith, and how they became believers. And I, ironically, again, I, I think it's a great challenge to Christians today. We come to know the Lord. We're born again uh, through faith, through the gospel, through hearing, the, hearing the gospel, we are born again. And that somehow we then try to supplement it in one way or another. And, and that's, that's a slippery sl slope once we do that. Once you try to supplement your faith, you're in trouble because you're making it sound like the faith is not enough. Mm -hmm. Like believing in Jesus is not enough. And believing in Jesus is it. Once you have Jesus, if you have Jesus, you have everything. If you don't have Jesus, you have nothing. Mm -hmm. and, and he basically says, if you try to get this other thing, then you're going to lose Jesus. If you try to get saved by the law, then Jesus will mean nothing to you. Because Jesus came and died for the very fact that we could not keep the law, that we could not obey the law. Even as Jews, you say we could not keep it. And forget Gentiles. You guys were never part of the covenant with Moses. Uh, so you're completely out of it. You're mm. Any questions? No. All right. So we'll stop there, verse 5. And next week, we'll pick up again on verse 6. Okay. All right? Good. Facebook, God bless you guys. Good night. Okay. Good night, Good night, Juliet. Good night, Victor.